let me introduce to you the panelists who are going to be joining us on stage uh, to share that with you right now. Roxana is moderating, so you, you stay exactly where you are. And let me introduce to you now the panelists for this session right now. So please welcome from humans.ai, Sabine Dima. Sabine, there's a, there's a shout, there's a clap, there's a clap. There's something, I can hear something coming for Sabina, that's right. It's getting her, it's not Sabina, sorry. Not Sabina, Sabina, sorry. <laughs> we didn't know you were here, because you just come out of nowhere, which is fine. We also have, from humans.ai, Valley Maloney. Is that right? Valley Maloney. He's not here. He's not here. No, no, no. Any reason why not? I just, I'm just interested. He's ill. Okay. We move on. Hopefully next one's not ill. PhD in cybermetics. I'm not sure whether that's uh, what he does, but it's Dr. Ravran Razvan Kosin. That's you. You're not ill. I hope not. Hope not. Right, we'll also move on. Dr. Radu Ionescu, Professor Dr. Radu Ionescu. Welcome. That's you. All coming from the other side of the stage, which is fantastic. And I'll leave it now over to Roxana to take this conversation in the right way. Thank you. First of all, uh, it is an honor for me to be your moderator. This is uh, the most interesting panel for me. And uh, I hope we are going to be able to offer some valuable information to the audience. Sab um, Sabine, uh, the first question is for you. So to give a bit of context, in the early 1990s, there was a tacit understanding that this technology will undoubtedly have a transformational impact, reshaping the way we do business, work, communicate with each other, and entertain ourselves. Fast forward 30 plus years in the future, and it seems that we stand again at the precipice of remarkable change. One of the main actors involved is yet again the internet, or to be more precise, a new iteration of the internet called Web3. From your perspective, how do you see today's iteration of Web3? Can we call it a revolution similar to the internet in the 1990s? Hello. First of all, thank you for, for having me for the presentation. Um, everybody knows that Web1 was about getting access to information. Web2 was about participating. And Web3 is about ownership. Where I see the, the biggest potential and the biggest opportunity not, is not in Web3 by itself, but it's seeing Web3 as a medium. It's in combining Web3 with other incredible technologies like AI, for example. So we said it before, and I think we were before, before our times, but I believe that Web3 combined with other incredible technology like AI, for example, can create something so extraordinary that not even us can, can, can perceive all the implications and how the future will, will look like. It's like trying to see as a human being how big the universe it is. It's clear that it's big, but we don't know, we don't know it for sure. And very beautifully said. So innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence can take its place in this new environment and maybe be the most important actor in this new environment. AI is the most powerful instrument humans have at their disposal, as it can answer the needs of a plethora of industries like healthcare, retail, and finance. The list of possible applications for AI is inexhaustible. Dr. Rosvan Kostin, this question is for you. From your knowledge of cybernetics and statistics, can you say that AI can rest and develop within a Web3 environment? Or does the centralized way remain the way to go for many years from now because of safety and ethical concerns? Hi. Um, good question. Um, in my opinion, Web3 is about uh, decentralization and transparency. Uh, in statistics, it's very important to understand what are the sources, the information in which are used when you try to get some insight from the data. Um, combined Web3 with AI, I think it's, it's much more powerful than what we have today, because today, if you look at ChatGPT, for example, no one knows 
what is the source of the information, how it is stored, how algorithms act on them, and why the results are the ones that we see. Now, if we put this into a decentralized system, Web3, it is clear, it's fully transparent. Thank you. Decentralization implies that no central entity has control over the flow of information and that the network as a whole doesn't have a single point of failure, making it more resilient to cybersecurity attacks. Uh, Dr. Rada Ionescu, considering your experience in computer science and your position as founder of Securif AI, which seems to be a centralized environment, how do you think blockchain can be used as a secure and transparent foundation for AI applications in Web3? Well, thank you for having me here and thank you for the question. Um, so, I would first like to say that at Securify, our platform is not fully centralized because, for example, we run all the AI models on edge devices that are distributed at different sites and they have access to data, to video data only from those sites. Uh, we do have a centralized component because the output of the AI models is sent to this cloud platform where we show different analytics reports to the clients and so on. But this, uh, the whole, the, the raw data is kept on the local devices, so we do not share this data in cloud. And also, this cloud platform is owned by the client in our case. Um, but if we would to, if we would shift to Web3, uh, I think uh, in our case would be just uh, finding a Web3 cloud platform uh, and basically adjusting our solution to be deployed in this Web3 cloud. So I think it would be as easy as that. What would be more interesting is to train. Uh, the AI models uh, on this local data. There are some uh, AI algorithms uh, today that are in the area of what's called federated learning, which means that you're training the models on some local machines on data that do not exchange data uh, between each other. So I think this is um, pretty much compatible to Web3. So in the future, our company we would like to um, train our models using federated learning, uh, which opposes the traditional way of training the models. When you gather the data on a server, you train your model on the server, and then uh, use the model. So now we are training the model in a centralized way, but we are doing the inference in a decentralized way. So in the future, we would also like to do the training in a de decentralized way. Thank you. That was a very insightful answer. Thank you. Sabine. What can we do to sustain the transition of an AI project from Web 2 to Web 3? How can a startup or a research project scale to Web 3? And what would be the main benefits? How we see it, bringing your AI to Web 3, it's like plugging your mobile device to a power source. It's like plugging your AI to the economy, to decentralize a life powerful economy. People tend to develop their AI right now, isolated in isolated ecosystems, they are doing their research there. But bringing your AI to a tree means plugging it to an economy. More than that, you can have instant access to your stakeholders, your data providers, your users, your dev builders. Imagine that on top of, of your AI, ChatGPT, for example, if you are bringing it to Web3, the develop, developers community can bring other interesting applications and being very rewarded for that. Blockchain and, and AI sounds incredible, but for a, for a startup, for a, for, for a developer, it's, it's very hard to bring his AI to Web3. There are different technologies, the ne network is different. Raising money, if you if you are very good technical, a very good technical guy, it's very hard for you to raise money because it implies that you have a different set skills, like raising money. Now, using Web3, you can finance your 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 startup using only a line of code, a smart contract. 
What we are trying to do, we are trying to help incredible AI technologies of AI, of, or AI startups to bring, to, to bring their AI to a tree without the focus, trying to help them with tokenomics, with closing the round, with creating the perfect product for them to, um, to, to create a successful uh, and to deploy a successful uh, product in, uh, in this new uh, ecosystem. Thank you. So, um, values like decentralization, data ownership, transparency, and trust, which are inherent to blockchain technology, define Web3. How can AI be integrated into this area, and how can we instill these values inside of AI? I would like to add on top of what Sabin said. So, for me, Web3 is technology plus economy. So the skill set that uh, Web3 developer needs to have uh, is not just coding, but also thinking about economical models, about algorithms, uh, about how to distribute the value, how to get adoption, and so on. Again, for AI to, in my opinion, for the AI to work correct is to make sure that whatever database we use as an information source, it is transparent and everyone can check. And everyone can flag if something is shady or it's not working, I suspect, and so on. And then you basically, you are able to eliminate every single doubt about how the AI is working. Because, you know, if we you remember in Romania there was a saying that it doesn't matter uh, who votes, it matters who counts the votes, you know. With Web3 and AI you can eliminate this. You can be sure that whoever voted and where the votes are stored is absolutely correctly interpreted by the algorithms. Thank you, very eloquently put. So, Considering what has been discussed so far, how favorable would an accelerator for artificial intelligence, for machine learning researchers, or AI startups would be at this moment? How, how do you finance your AI project nowadays? Whoever wants to pick up this question. So, uh, I would say, um, the expertise is growing because, for example, at uh, my university we have a, a really good master's program in artificial intelligence. So we have like uh, 500, uh, sorry, five, uh, 50 uh, students that uh, come out every year from this program and they are um, very well trained in my opinion. Um, but I still think that um, it is a job that is highly paid currently, so um, it's, maybe it's more expensive than a software developer to find an AI developer, but it's also kind of uh, expected because the, the knowledge, the mathematic, mathematics involved and so on um, is a bit more um, complex, so it's more high level, so it's expected to uh, to have less people and so on. But I think with the open source projects um, that researchers release uh, every day, uh, I think this is becoming more um, democratized in a way. So um, I, I've seen, uh, for example, some startups that they don't necessarily have um, top level experts in AI, but they still have a good technology because they they rely on this open source software, they take it, they uh, reassemble it, they train it on more data, and then um, they come up with something more powerful that is useful for, for their clients. So, yeah, it's somewhere here in the field. Somebody said in a tweet that it's not fair to compare a normal VC with a crypto VC because they are playing with different roles. So for now, if you're an AI researcher and if you have a very good AI technology, that means that you're focusing on developing that AI technology. When you're, try when you're trying to raise money, that's a, complete, com com a different action. 
So you need to ignore your AI and focus on raising a round that can take up to six months and we're coming back to your AI, probably it's obsolete. So block, imagine that in a perfect world you have a powerful AI, when you plug it into blockchain and if it's a real powerful AI and it solves a real pro problem, you can get financed in seconds. So that means that the AI researchers can focus only on their development and their innovation and in instant when you plug it to a powerful ecosystem, you have enough money to create, uh, to, to fund your, 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 your continuous development. I would actually also want to add something. I, I look forward for the moment when the universities will uh, teach the developers, and not only the developers, uh, the new Web3 economy. So, like uh, somebody said, it's totally different than the normal economy that we know. And it would be really, really cool to have, I don't know, a courses about economics, about how to create a microeconomy, how to create your algorithms that distribute the value, and so on and so forth. I agree, and that at our university we have these uh, lectures from the industry. So that we have people from the industry that come to our university and have uh, they take different classes. So um, yeah, we can also discuss maybe after this session. If you're interested in this, we can uh, propose uh, such a, a lecture for our students for Web3. Well, it's, it's actually really, really fun. So Samin uh, knows because I, I've met with him in the morning and I was explaining the new project that we've created two weeks ago. And it's really, really fun. You are just like the national bank, <laughs> not the national bank. Uh, but you are creating the rules of an economy, and it's, it's actually really fun. And it's, it implies economics, it implies technology, it implies development, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there are very, very few people out there that can help, and I think that universities should be more paying more attention to this. Um, for I, the next I completely year. agree with uh, your views because it all starts with education, and universities are the centerpieces of where innovation and research begins. And as Sabine said, uh, researchers have a particular set of skills and business people have a different set of